Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show, a program dedicated to bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you won't hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as He is commanded in Ephesians 5.11. Now here's your host, Good Fight Ministries' own Chad Davidson. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm sure if you're like anyone else, you've been dealing a lot with what's going on in the news. You've been talking about, maybe with your friends, family, and so forth, about things that are going on in our very culture today. Maybe even things that have to do with race. Obviously, that's been a huge thing, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, George Floyd, your neighboring police officers, whatever it may be. These are important topics. We want to get down to the root of them. And so what we're going to do today is talk with a brother in Christ who's had a burden on his heart to specifically talk about the issue of not only critical race theory, but Marxism and also cultural Marxism. So with me today is my good brother in Christ, Robert McKinley. How are you doing today, brother? Doing great, bro. I am so happy to be here. So blessed. Uh, I am uh, just honored to get a chance to be able to talk about this and humbled as well, because this is a tough subject that I really believe... uh, we need to talk about and we need to get the scriptures on it, and, but actually learn about certain key concepts and what it is and what it isn't so people are less confused about what's happening. Yeah, I think one of the most important things is that I do believe a lot of times conversations can happen one with another, whether it is a white and a black guy or two black guys or two white guys or whatever it may be. A lot of times these conversations happen and it's just two people saying a lot of terms that no one actually has down a meaning of what they're talking about. And right. I think a lot of times they're talking over, beside, and on the width of their friend. And so what we want to do today is is kind of break down, and I know with Robert having this on his heart, want to break down some of the terminology that's used and some of a, I I guess the better better way to say this is the core foundations to understand where we've come in the culture. So I guess the best place to start, which is a term we hear thrown out a lot, is Marxism. Now, what is Marxism? Okay, so yeah, uh, before we get to that, I just want to make sure I uh, make this understood that the things I'm about to say, I'm not saying there's that there's no problems in our country. We don't have any you know issues with uh, racism, you know, with the police brutality <laughs> or yeah. things like that. I mean, these things exist. I mean, we have. A, I mean, for an example, well, we could have someone getting uh, getting getting arrested for something they didn't do and being forced to take a plea deal when uh, they were innocent. You know, mm-hmm. and so that that's the problem. That, these are mm-hmm. things we need to address, but we don't want the wrong people addressing these things. Like, for instance, if you are, uh, I'm sure you have a house and maybe you have an electrical problem, you will call in an electrician, a certified electrician to diagnose the problem. Uh, certainly you wouldn't want to call in a, an electrician that had an issue with you and secretly wanted to use that electrical part or problem to burn down your whole house, right? Because he wanted to rebuild <laughs> it in his own image. Amen. You wouldn't want that. You just want him to fix that problem, right? So... And this is exactly when we start getting into Marxism, this is what we're talking about. Uh, now, there's two flavors of Marxism. First, we have classic Marxism, and then we have cultural Marxism. Classic Marxism is the uh, is written as a doctrine penned by Karl Marx. He wrote a, a three-volume book called Capital. What it basically does, just to sum it up, not because we only have so much time, it basically seeks to explain why when we look in, the, uh, in our culture, for instance, we see rich neighborhoods over here, we got poor slums over here, and we got... And that causes people, poor people, to want to steal from the rich people because they're jealous because these people have have a lot and these people don't have as much. And so what uh, Marxism seeks to do, what it says is that the fault for all of this is the, uh, the, the fault for all of it is capitalism. It is the fact that we have people that rich people that are making these they're making all this money. They got companies, they have farms, they're uh, landlords and they have they own all this private property and they are basically exploiting all of the poor people. And so what we need to do is get rid of all these people and make everything government on. So now we'll have equal outcomes for everyone. So this is, this is classic Marxism. And uh, we do have a, uh, a guy that was, uh, that was very heavy into classic Marxism in our country in the past. His name is Manning Johnson. And this guy, uh, he was actually a black man that was a, he was a member of the American, the Communist Party here in America. And he, he was in it up until right before Germany invaded Poland, okay? He saw what was happening and got out of it, but he, 
He got in, he's 21 years old. So this fellow wrote a book called Color, Communism, and Common Sense in 1958. He died in 1959. Anyone wants to look at his book, you can find it on the internet. It's at uh, www.manningjohnson.org. You can find the book right there. You also can find his the, the last message that he gave at a church in Seattle before he died. And so, what I'm going to do is just read a couple of a uh, couple of things out of his uh, out of his book, so we can get an understanding of what he saw back in the 1950s. What uh, what he was testifying about. I mean, he did he did a lot of things against to stop a lot of the communists uh, that was happening, the communism that was trying to take over in the country back then. So. Wow, you know, and I think it's really great before we even get into to Marxism yeah. is to talk about this this man, uh, yeah. Manning Johnson, right. because I know you've been reading uh, quite a bit from him and, and you've even read some of this to me. And so I'd love for them to, to get an understanding of not, as you've already mentioned, who he is, but yeah. uh, really some of the stuff that he's written. Okay, good. So what I will do is I'll just read from chapter five, a little small portion of something he wrote. Okay, let's see if this resonates with you if you're hearing this in the culture today. Out of the fires of such exacting indoctrination and training have come the treacherous Negro red leaders who served faithfully their masters in the Kremlin, the James Jacksons, Henry Winstons, the William Pattersons, the Louise Thompsons, the Maude Whites, the Harvey Haywoods, the Ben Davies, the Doxy Wilkerson's, and the James W. Forrest et al. make up the cadre around which the present racial conflict or liberation movement is being built. Now, he used the word liberation movement there. Now, that should sound very familiar if you're familiar, familiar with any of the uh, things that some of the current Black Lives leaders, uh, la excuse me, Black Lives Matter leaders have said today. And hopefully we have a clip of that. We can pray a little bit from Alicia Garza. Yeah, we actually do have a clip here that we're going to be playing here in a second. And just think about this. Think about what, what has been said in that quote and think how it relates also 50, over 50 years ago, that was written to what Alicia Garza, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, has to say right here. It's important that black lives make the news in other ways beyond our deaths and our tragedies. And at the same time, it obscures what the fight is actually about. The fight absolutely is about eradicating police violence and police terrorism. The fight is absolutely about eliminating the criminalization of black people and people of color and other oppressed peoples. But honestly, this fight is about black liberation. I mean, look at that, Rob. Okay. <laughs> that, that sounds, uh, I don't know, I guess eerie a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, a little eerie to me. And I mean, what, one thing I'll say is I don't believe in coincidences. So it didn't work back then, it was thwarted. But now we see it coming back with more vigor with different players saying the same exact things. Uh, another portion of Manning Johnson's book, and we're still talking about classic Marxism, though. Another portion of it, we'll read from chapter eight of his book, called, excuse me, excuse me, chapter seven, called Creating Hate. The red propagandists distort the facts concerning racial differences for ulterior motives. All the right is not on the side of the Negro. Neither is all the wrong. The same holds true with regard to the white man's side. The repository of good or evil is not to be found in any particular race. Black men are just as good or as bad as white men. Yellow men are just as good or bad as brown or red. It ill behooves anyone to speak about the other. White men sold white men as slaves. Black men sold black men as slaves. Black rulers are no more humane than yellow, red, or white rulers. Neither are they less brutal. The placing of the repository of everything right and just among the darker races is a dastardly communist trick to use race as a means of grabbing and enslaving the whole of humanity. Okay, so now, what he's talking about is the plan. I mean, this guy was a high-ranking member of the, uh, the Communist Party in America. I mean, he even ran for a seat in one of the, uh, I think in New York somewhere. He ran for a seat back then when, they, when he was still into it. He got out of this in, the, in the, right before, like I said earlier, right before Germany invaded Poland and became a Christian. And then he started, of course, going back and exposing a lot of these things, and he was a big benefit to the government. So wow, I mean, I mean, it's really incredible. And when you hear that, and yeah. and when I'm listening to him say these things, it reminds me of so many scriptures that are just popping in my head. You yeah. know, I think of Ezekiel chapter 18 specifically: "The soul mm -hmm. that sins shall die." And in fact, over and over again, even in that chapter, in chapter 18, it starts off with saying, "You are no longer allowed to say this proverb in Israel that the." 
The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But ultimately, you can't blame your father. You can't blame your children if they follow or not follow or so forth. And then also in Acts chapter 17 specifically, that every single person came from Adam and Eve. And it tells us, regardless, whether, you know, you grew up in uh, Alabama, you mm -hmm. know, and I grew up here in, in yeah. Simi Valley. Well, Mississippi. And Mississippi, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, look at right. me all yeah. messed up. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mississippi, and I grew up right. here in Simi Valley. Right. I was here in this time, in this place, for one purpose, that I may seek, grope, and find God, you know? Right. And so you hear that, and there are wicked people on, on every side. Exactly. You and know? So the repository of evil definitely doesn't reside, doesn't reside with only one race. Uh, but also, we can talk about this. So this is classic Marxism, though. So classic Marxism seeks to demonize all capitalism or all capitalistic societies. So anything that's capitalistic is going to be built on exploitation. This is a theory uh, that, it, that it espouses, but it doesn't prove it. Okay, so and now cultural Marxism. So cultural Marxism is slightly different. So what happened was Marx predicted that there was going to be a proletarian or a common man revolution that was going to overthrow every capitalistic society because of all of the exploitation. And he predicted it. It never happened. So now we have other people trying to to, to uh, explain why it never happened. And this is where we enter with cultural Marxism. Mm. You need two, you need to know about two people, or if you're going to do your own research, you research Antonio Gramsci. This is the first person who penned some, uh, some of this doctrine. He's the one that came up with the concept of cultural hegemony, talking about the leadership of any, of any country you go into. Uh, you also need to know about the, the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School is not, was not a physical school, but it's a, it was a group of individuals who were Marxists, and they were looking at causing a cultural revolution, not a physical one with force, but just a cultural revolution where we would, where a whole culture would be overturned. So cultural hegemony. So in our country, for instance, the cultural hegemony here, or the hegemony here is, has nothing to do with how a person thinks, has nothing to do with what's in their heart, has all about, has everything to do with boxes you check, okay? So the cultural hegemony here in America is first, you have to be white, male, uh, heterosexual, cisgendered, native born, able-bodied. You check those boxes, according to cultural Marxism, you are privileged. Okay, and that's where white privilege come from. And everyone who is not a part of that hegemony is considered a minority and are thus oppressed by the hegemony. And so cultural Marxism seeks to overthrow this. And the way they do this is they find that, as we talked about earlier, the little electrical problem, whatever little problem they can find in this country, we know race is a huge topic that you can use to spark a fire that could burn down the entire country. You go to another country, the race may not be this. You go to, you, let's say you go somewhere like uh, former Yugoslavia. It wasn't race you could use there, it was religion. So they, you could go there and you would pull on that thread, start criticizing it. So one of the concepts of, uh, that the grant, excuse me, that the, uh, the Frankfurt School came up with is called critical theories. One of the methods they, they uh, came up with as, as to how to spark this revolution. Now, a little history on the, on the, uh, the Frankfurt School. They started out, of course, in Germany when when Hitler and everything started going. They came over here and went to Col and uh, went to Columbia University. Stayed there, pushed a lot of their thoughts around there. And after everything cooled off over in Germany, they went back, but they left their doctrine here. So if anyone goes to Columbia University, they're going to learn a whole lot about critical theory, uh, even other concepts like uh, tolerance, other concepts like uh, political correctness come out of, come from, uh, come from the Frankfurt School, okay? So when we go with critical theory, so the, what this is all, this theory is about is we're gonna keep criticizing, find something we don't like in, the, in society, we're gonna criticize it, criticize it, criticize it until nobody wants to agree with this. No, everybody hates it, nobody wants anything to do with it. So now we get to critical race theory, okay? And so you can see critical race theory is only a delineation of critical theory. You can do it. You can do. You can have critical gender theory, critical sexuality theory. So they just criticize whatever it is, and the whole goal of this is to overturn the culture hegemony. So uh, if it's race theory, we we want we want to take white down and put black up. It comes to sexuality, we want to take heterosexuality down and put homosexuality up. It comes to gender, we want to put cisgender or just which is mainly mainly normal. Okay, we want to put cisgender down, transgender up. 
We want to get we want to we want to normalize what is abnormal and we want to uh, we want to make what is normal abnormal. And so that's really what critical theory does. And is that where how well is that working in society right now? Yeah, it's it's pretty ugly out there, you know, and one of the things it does and, and this is more for open discussion for, okay. for us talking about this, because one of the things it does, as I've noticed, is that this bridge that cultural, you know, Marxism and classic Marxism has made has really put a divide so much in my 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 black and my black brothers or black friends. Uh, that maybe even aren't, aren't believers and not. Mm-hmm. And it really has done a great job of separating us so that the gospel is now hindered and a, lo- yeah. a lot of times because I'm, you know, perfect example, right? I am this privileged white male. And so when I'm coming to share the gospel, instead of me just sharing the gospel that, hey, I, I get to be in Christ. I can't believe it. I was a dirtbag that God saved. Yeah. Instead of that being the message, I it, it seems as though there's a, a great bridge divide there that I'm going to be having to, you know, tell you about something that you don't know about because of my privilege and, and so forth, you know? Yeah. And so I, I'm wondering if you've noticed that there's been any sort of, uh, that's been an issue, you know? Definitely. Uh, even me as a, as a black man, uh, when I start talking about these things, talking about how, you know, uh, I really don't agree with this white privilege, not this concept of white privilege, because what people do is they will read their own experiences of what they observe into certain phrases like white privilege. So they'll Think about, well, you know, there's been laws, uh, laws that benefited white people more so than black people, prevented black people from getting loans or even laws that 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 disproportionately target black men over uh, you know, white men when it comes to crime. And so they'll say that there are laws that I'm not aware of any current laws that are on the books that say this. Now, I would say there's systemic racism if I saw laws, but. What I notice is that there now I'm not going to say there's no racism. There are people that are <laughs> racist. Of course, there are people that are racist in, you know, in, in our society still. And I don't think there's uh, that's a problem we can solve. We're not going to be able to change everybody's heart and make them have a common sense to, to not be a racist. But what we can do is if we find out that someone like that is in a position of authority, we just need to have them removed. OK, because the laws on the books do not say the black man should get. 15 years for this crime and the white person should get a, white, a slap on the wrist. So since the laws don't say that, that means that the, the people in those positions are making this determination. And if we find out they're doing that, they need to be addressed. And we need to just remove those people from those positions. But that isn't. But to say the whole, the whole capitalistic system is the cause of this is where we know we're dealing with Marxists here. As a matter of fact, another from that same, another clip from uh, uh, Lisa Garza, she said this very clearly that black people could not be free in this country unless capitalism was torn down. And I'm like, you know, I have a problem with that because I know a lot of black people that have uh, actually done very well here. You know, (laughs) some of us are business owners, some of us stockholders with a lot of, you know, we've, we have a lot of business here. And so I don't understand why you would say uh, that, that black people can never be free unless capitalism is torn down unless you have an ulterior motive. Of course you want to bring in socialism. So, Maybe we can play that clip of her saying this at that conference, same conference. Yeah, let's play it. Let's play it right now. It's not possible for a world to emerge where black lives matter if it's under capitalism. And it's not possible to abolish capitalism without a struggle against national oppression and gender oppression. So the fight against police terror, police violence, state violence is but one front of many. So it's interesting that we're seeing some, as you already mentioned, the the ulterior motives. You know, obviously it seems like, you know, when we originally did a a couple of different episodes on Black Lives Matter specifically, we showed some of the witchcraft behind some of the founders and some of the stuff, the prayers that they do Mm -hmm. uh, beforehand, not to the one true God. But then also what, what we showed is that they were also pushing LGBTQ, uh, a lot of homosexuality, transgenderism, and so forth. And like you said, I think a lot of people don't understand that it's the foundation of what their epistemology is, what what their what their what what it is from the ground. So when you see the ulterior motive, that it's really not simply just to show Black Lives Matter, because I hope any sane person, right, and anybody who would be unwilling to say that, if it wasn't tied alongside with the rest of the train. 
Anyone that was unwilling to say that, I'm going to say, well, obviously, I don't even, I don't consider you a believer if you don't right. care about black lives, Amen. especially black baby lives, by the way. Amen. Um, and uh, if if we don't, if we aren't unable to say that, I would also say you're not my brother in Christ. <laughs> exactly. But Amen. also, yeah, where are you just even with having the logos, having logic that God has made you in his image uh, to have? I mean, just that's out of sorts. But there is seemingly an ulterior motive when it comes to Black Lives Matter in this whole movement. Exactly. And, and that the ulterior motive is now to, to turn on capitalism. So that's the sad part about this, that what Manning Johnson, I was reading from his book, I, I encourage everybody to go and take give his book a read. It's not right. It's on the Internet. You can click on it. Or you don't have to pay for it. You can just go read it. But this guy was a part of a movement back then that was looking to tear down capitalism in this country because this is the last big beacon of hope we have in the world where it's a, a free capitalistic nation and there are those who want to tear it down and make it into a communist socialist nation. And it's very clear when you go and listen to them, you read this, you can see. And then the fact that uh, we could also point to things that that uh, uh, there's a common right back then it was the Reds. Now we have China that's involved with finance and some of the some of these uh, these current movements. And they this is a communist. This is a communist country right now. So they have a lot of say so in what is going on with these movements. So they're paying a lot of these people. In China. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's from it's China's finance and so they're getting yeah. something out of it. So what I would just encourage everybody to do if we hear this, man, please pray and understand what is going on here. But you need to seek to study these things out, not just uh not just allow your emotions to be stroked, because that's exactly what they're counting on is for you to get emotional and to not look into things and find out what's actually going on. And to uh, I mean to look I mean look into Manning Johnson, look into look into what cultural Marxism is, look into look into what classic Marxism is, and understand what the goal of it is is basically not to liberate anyone, except for people who are empowered in, uh, in the government. That's all it's going to liberate. It's not going to liberate black people. So yeah. No, and I and I think there's a couple of things that happen, and then, and maybe you know you can chime in on that as well. Okay. That we we come to a place where you have like the pendulum swing, where mm. on one side you know, everybody's really racist, you know, they have interior, you know, internally, the, the internal racism and so forth. And then you have this other side where it's like, well, there's really no racism going on. There's yeah. no such thing as racism. I think that's anti-scriptural. We're told right. in times that nation ethnos will rise against ethnos. So right. It's not, it's non-scriptural uh, just to even have that vantage point. But I, I, I think there is this, this middle ground that says, can we, can we weed out, as you said, those in authority can we get out those people that are wicked? But can we actually point out when it's specifically racism that's right. going on? You know, is there a way you think as a, if biblically to, yeah. to, to root that out in a biblical manner? Yeah, well, when it comes to racism, the, the main way you get that out, of course, is repentance. I mean, a person <laughs> that, that truly repents, the problem is we have, uh, and, and I hate to say this, but in this country, it's, but it's, it's true. In this country, we do have a history, nasty history of people professing to be Christians while practicing racism. Yep. So that is the issue right there. Some people, uh, I've I've been on the other side of this argument where I've uh, experienced Christians who who are denigrate me or get upset with me because I have a problem with the Confederate flag, for instance. Right. That that is a now you tie that flag to the cornerstone speech of the Confederacy, and that flag represents a racist uh, ideology. That is systemic racism because if you go and read that document, it's totally racist. I mean, it's yeah. saying that. The black man is not equal to the white man. I mean, it's clearly spelled out in that document. So to say that there's no racism or there's never been any systemic racism is would be a farce. But uh, what people need to do is if you if if you realize you agree with some of these adop ideologies, you need to repent and really repent. You have to change your mind about these ideologies. You can't just, you know, God's not going to accept you if you have this hatred or this this uh, feeling of superiority to someone else due to your race, regardless of which side you're on, white or black, Latino, whatever, you should love everyone equally, okay? And it's not to say that you're not going to, I mean, like, you know, in the black culture, there are certain things I do like in, in the black culture. I like a lot of the food. I like a lot of like, the <laughs> dance. I like that. I don't think that's racist. Yeah, yeah. I like, no, like my food, no, no. especially ribs. You know, I like, I'm, I'm going to like my ribs. So, Amen. So, Amen <laughs> but Amen what I'm that. saying is that, you know, but when it, the real thing that will solve this, of course, if we had as many people as willing to truly repent, change their, have a change of heart, change of mind concerning Christ, and choose to love their brother regardless of color. And, of course, call out injustice when we really see it, but call it what it is. Don't call it racism. Like, for instance, uh, I mean, this might be a little controversial, but with George Floyd, 
it was police brutality, clear. I mean, I can clearly see that this cop does not deserve to get, get off for what he did. He had complaints on him in the past, and I have no idea why the guy remained a policeman that long. But to say it was racially motivated without evidence speaking, showing that he was racially, it was a racial issue, that's a problem. You don't want to call it racism when it's really just a guy that made, that was being too excessive in his force and with his force. And like, he never should have put his knee on his neck. And he does deserve, he deserves to be prosecuted for what he did. Yeah. So I would agree with that. So, but uh, you just don't want to make everything about racism because when it's not, because then people start, that's when that other pendulum comes in. People are, well, you're just calling everything racism. Yeah. And so, but the facts should matter. Whatever the case is, the facts should matter. And so we don't want to just, you know, act like we have some type of uh, ethnic Gnosticism. We got this secret knowledge about the motives of everybody just because of their race, you know? So no, that's good. I like the ethnic Gnosticism. That's really yeah. good. And I think it is, you know, so important because if you're somebody who, who loves the Lord, yeah. One of the things that you love is truth, right? You know, and and so you want to always get down to what is true, and also we want to be sensible, you know, people, and we also want to be sensitive to mm -hmm. people that, as you mentioned, we can look back and and you look at the Confederate flag. You know, right. we've talked about this at length, you and I, yeah. just privately, yeah. you know, and you look at that, and like you said, that cornerstone speech when you you sent that to me, and I read it, and you know, I I know I don't have it in front of me, otherwise I'd read some of it. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't want to, but uh, you yeah, know, it's, it's, pretty, pretty it's like looking at porn, looking at that thing. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Because it's so wicked. You know, it's like wow, this is just heartbreaking. But I think you know, as as we're as we're kind of getting towards the end here, you know, okay. just got a couple minutes left. You know, I would love for you know, if somebody's listening in and they're thinking, hey. You know, I, you know, I, I've been messing up this way, or right. I've, I've fallen for these lies. You know, um, whatever it may be, or you have hate mm -hmm. uh, deep down in your heart. You know, for whatever it is, you yeah. know, it doesn't matter. Maybe you were wronged by someone. How many people? And I, I've mentioned this on shows before. How many ladies have literally gone into lesbianism because they were beaten by a man yeah. or cheated on, and 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 so forth. Right. So I, you know, I understand that the reaction a lot of times to wickedness is is tough so maybe right. you have experienced legitimate racism right at 100 that someone yeah. you've got passed up on a job or so forth or yeah. literally been called names because yeah. of of who you are but is there a message of hope for the last two minutes that we can give to someone who maybe uh is in a situation like that where they've had that happen and they have this embittered heart towards yeah. someone of the other race that we could share with them uh, a hope that could maybe change the heart yeah well of course uh Forgiveness is the first step in that. If you have someone that has done you wrong, what, regardless of race, whatever, you need to forgive because forgiveness doesn't, okay, just because you forgive someone doesn't mean you need to trust that person because sometimes you, can, you need to forgive people even when they aren't even sorry for what they did. Yeah. That forgiveness really benefits you, not, not, not more than the other person, okay? It keeps you from being bitter within. And also, I would say if you've been like following some of these things, watch what you're watching because there are a lot of documentaries out here that are, purposely meant to indoctrinate you to get you to fall for this cultural Marxism. I mean, documentaries like the 13th on, uh, on Netflix, that, that documentary gives a false history as though there's a whole bunch of black people that were once we were emancipated, our ancestors were emancipated from slavery and they were arrested now. And so this is where the capitalistic system came in now to keep profiting off the free labor of blacks. They arrested all these black people and made them, uh, of course, made them profit all these, these white corporations back then, the businesses back then, so they can continue to do it. But when I go back and read people like Frederick Douglass and uh, Booker T. Washington, black men, prominent black men who were alive at that time, I don't see anything in their writings about uh, a mass incarceration of black people. So just go back and do your research. Facts. Facts should be able to, if you dive into the facts, you'll find out what is true and what isn't. And definitely you need to dive into the truth of the scriptures because the scriptures is what's going to help heal your heart. You, you trust Christ. It's not a white man's religion. It's not a black man's religion. It's a it's a godly man's religion. Okay, <laughs> that's what you really want to dive into the scriptures. Amen, bro. So. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Rob, for coming and sharing your heart with us. I know this was meant a lot to you. And and thank you guys for listening. You have been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show. God bless you guys. You've been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show, brought to you by Good Fight Ministries. If you're blessed by this show and would like to partner with us, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash goodfight. Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062. Or call us toll free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. 
We hope you'll tune in next time on the Good Fight Radio Show. 